keep you up to date on a few things before um, sermon time or time of teaching. And this morning is no different. Um, I, I want to ask you to be praying for um, Roy White, who is going to be going in to um, have some shoulder surgery done this coming Thursday. And I know the family would appreciate greatly if, if uh, we were just praying for Roy's um, successful surgery. Um, along those lines, we pray all the time for people with serious, serious things that are going on. Um, Frank Stover, um, Sabrina Nowinski's father, had some extensive surgery done this past week to remove cancer from his body. Sabrina sends me a message middle week, and she says the doctors got back to her and said they think they got all the cancer out of his body. So praise the Lord for that. Amen. And in a similar vein, Loretta uh, Bryant this morning before um, church services came up to me and said that she's done two testing, has a third test to go, and um, all indications are is that the cancer that she's been battling is completely gone from her body. So we praise the Lord for that. And, and I, hear, I hear those reports back, and in, on one hand, I'm just elated and so happy. Another part of me, I'm not surprised, because that's exactly what we've been praying, and our God has been at work in both of these situations. So praise the Lord for, for both of those um, outcomes. We give God all the glory. And this morning, um, last thing I wanted to mention before our time of teaching, it's already been said that Katie Darling is, is um, having a chili cook fundraiser um, this, uh, right after services today. Here is a young lady who's getting ready to go out into the mission field on her own. I don't mean by herself, but she's decided this on her own. And, and the, the last and least thing that we can do is come alongside her and, and encourage her, pray for her, um, verbally support her, write her letters of encouragement, send her Facebook posts. You do your stuff that you normally do. But this afternoon is all about trying to raise money to give to her mission trip. And so when she came up to me um, a few w weeks ago, a couple months ago, and said, could this church help her in that effort to go on a mission trip? I said, Katie, that's like saying, um, dangling a stake in front of a hungry dog and saying, can you help? You know, it, it, of course we can, because you're going on a mission trip for the Lord to spread the good news. So do everything you can to encourage and help Katie Darling. Okay, if you have your Bibles, electronic devices, however you read the word, um, if you would flip open to Matthew the 18th chapter, Matthew 18, and we'll be reading verses 21 through 35. Um, we're continuing in our study of the parables of Jesus Christ. Um, uh, great lessons from Jesus uh, with regard to important things that we need to know about. And this morning is no different. Matthew 18, verses 21 through 35. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not just seven times, but 77 times. Now that's not the parable yet. That's the preamble to the parable. It's the question that prompted Jesus to get into the parable. But it's important to note that this parable starts off with a question that prompts Jesus to tell the parable. And the question was simply, how many times shall I forgive my brother? And when Peter, of all people, asked that question, I got to believe that Peter, when he asked that question, went to Jesus with what he thought was a generous offer. Up to seven times? You know, like, like I'm really pulling out the, the, the forgiveness bank account here, you know, up to seven times. Because in the Old Testament, there was times when God forgave someone or some country four times, and after the fourth time, it's like the hammer came down, okay? And so I'm sure Peter had that somewhere in the back of his mind when he said up to seven times, he probably expected Jesus to go, Peter, good job, buddy. You really got this spiritual thing going on because you're willing to forgive up to seven times. And then Jesus says, I tell you, not just seven times, but 
but 77 times. And then Jesus would go into this parable and tell this story that we're going to read here in just a second about how important it is to forgive. Now, is this a parable that we need to hear this morning? I'll just ask it before we even read it. Do we need to hear about forgiveness, huh? How many of you this morning, you know, September 22nd, 2019, you know, at, at almost 10 o'clock in the morning, have something on your heart that someone has done wrong to you or somebody that you know or somebody that you care about that you need to forgive? Huh? Okay, just me and Rebecca. Okay, we're the only two. Okay, yeah, okay. Raise your hand if you have something that you need to forgive right now. Huh? Man, we do. And Jesus knew that we deal with this forgiveness thing a lot, and so he taught on it. Okay? As a matter of fact, when, when, when you read Jesus' parables, he never does a parable on a topic that is of minutia order. He never covers topics that are like, ants eyebrow type stuff. He covers big stuff, important stuff. And so this morning, this topic of forgiveness is one of those. It's a big topic to Jesus. So here's what Jesus says in the parable. Because of this, the question that was asked, because of this, the kingdom of heaven, Jesus said, is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And as he began the settlements, a debtor was brought to him owing 10,000 talents. Let me stop just for a second. 10,000 talents. Say, what's that? 10,000 talents is the equivalent of 10,000, 10,000 bags of gold. Okay? Picture up on this stage. This stage probably, maybe it could, I don't know, but it couldn't probably hold 10,000 bags of gold. So that's how much this guy owed this other person. And, and I'll share with you some other little insights. Owing people back in Jesus' day was a big deal. It's not like it is today. Like if you owe somebody and you decide, you know, a year or six months down the road that you don't want to pay them back, you just go, okay, I'll blow it off. I'll file bankruptcy. You know, or I'll, or I'll just take a bad hit on my credit report. In Jesus' day, if you owed somebody something and you didn't pay them back, whether it was a small amount or a big amount, that person could have you put into what's called debtor jail. Which meant you went behind bars. And you could have everything you own confiscated from you and sold in order to pay off that debt. And not only you, there was potential of collateral damage where your whole family could be imprisoned with you until somehow that debt got paid off. It was a big deal. And so we'll continue the story. And as, as he began the settlements, a debtor was brought to him owing 10,000 talents. Since the man was unable to pay, that's a key phrase, the master ordered that he be sold to pay his debt. So there you go. The master ordered that he be sold to pay his debt along with his wife and children and everything he owned. Then the servant fell on his knees before him. And he said, have patience with me. He begged, and I will pay back everything. All he was asking for was patience, not debt forgiveness. Just have patience. Give me some time, and I'll pay back everything. Listen to the next line. His master had compassion on him and forgave his debt and released him. Underline, star, highlight that phrase. His master had compassion on him, forgave his debt, and released him. You notice the master didn't say, okay, listen, I'll give you the time, as you're asking for. That's all he asked for was some time. He said, forget the time. He didn't say, I'm going to restructure your debt. I'll give you a lower interest rate or, or I'll allow you to make smaller monthly payments. He didn't even offer that. He just canceled the debt. He forgave the debt, and then he released him. That's what the master did for a servant. Now, let me lay a little bit more groundwork. Who does the master represent in this parable? God. Who does the servant represent? Us. Okay? There's going to be two servants. Okay? And I'll let you pick who you represent. Okay? So we'll keep reading. But when that servant went out, this is the one that just had his debt 
released and, 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 and done away with, when that servant went out, he found one of his own fellow servants. So this is the servant's servant. He found one of his own fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. Now, how much is a denarii? A denarii is about a, a day's wage, back in, you know, put it in, in practical terms. So a hundred denarii would be about four months or five months worth of pay. Okay, not a small amount of money, you know, if you look at it in today's terms, but not, certainly not, you know, thousands of bags of gold type money either. And when he found this servant who owed him 100 denarii, he grabbed him and began to choke him, saying, pay back what you owe me. So his fellow servant fell down and begged him. Notice he did exactly what he just got done doing with his master. He fell down and begged him, and he said, have patience with me, and I will pay you back. The exact same phrase that he had just used with his master. But look at the response from the servant, the first servant. But he refused. Instead, he went and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay his debt. When his fellow servants, these are people that are just looking from afar, from a distance, when his fellow servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed. And they went and recounted all of this to their master. Paraphrase, they ratted him out. Okay? They just went and told, you know, the, the big master what the first line servant had done. Okay? And here's what happened. Then the master, the, the big master, summoned him and declared... You wicked servant. There's an exclamation point in the Bible after that statement because it's said with a lot of energy and emphasis. You wicked servant. I forgave all your debt because you begged me. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should repay all that he owed. And this parable ends with this statement, that is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. Is this a hard-hitting parable? Yeah, it is. Is it a serious-sounding parable? Oh, yeah, it is. Uh, Jesus is very serious about this notion of forgiveness. Very serious about this notion. Um, you might say, that Jesus was putting a lot of emphasis on the need that you and I have to forgive other people as God has forgiven us. Listen to what the words of this parable say at the end. When the other servants saw this, they reported this all back to the master. And the master calls in his servant and he says, what? You what servant? You, you naughty servant? You, you servant that needs to learn something a little bit better? You servant that is just having a bad day, servant? No, he says, you wicked servant. Now, listen, that, that language is there for a reason, church. Because, I don't know about you, but there's times when I don't forgive as I shouldn't. And here's how I process it. This is not that big a deal. When I don't forgive somebody who's wronged me and I just want to hold a grudge and I may just want to do something back to him and I want to be naughty back or I want to spread some rumor about him or I want to hurt back, I want to, I want to do 13 things to even the score, I justify it sometimes. And I justify it based on the mindset that they got it coming. Can you relate? When Jesus tells this parable, he's saying in his own way, when we take an attitude of anything short of forgiveness, we're wicked. We are taking a wicked response. Not just a little bit naughty or a kind of like he'll get over it type of response, but it's a wicked response not to forgive. So I emphasize this point right out the gate, that forgiveness is a big deal to God. A very big deal to God. That's the main message in this parable. Is, is, that, is that forgiving somebody is not just a, oh, we'll get over it type of thing. Forgiveness and lack of forgiveness is making a conscious choice not to forgive. 
someone who has done you wrong in the past. And it brings home the core message. Look at the end of the parable. This is how our Heavenly Father will treat us unless we forgive our brother from our heart. Now that last little three words I think is important. That we need to forgive our brother or sister who's wronged us from our heart. Because it's easy to just go through the motion. You know, Wally does something to offend me. And I'm mad. And I'm angry at Wally. You know, but I'll just kind of act. Go through the motions like Wally and I are cool. But really in my heart, I'm harboring some vicious, mean, venomous, anger, retaliation type stuff towards Wally. And God says, unless you get down to the heart, Phil, and forgive Wally, man, you're, you're doing some wicked stuff from your heart. I want to underscore that, underline that in your text. That forgiveness needs to come from deep within us, not just superficially. And someone can look at this thing and they can go, why is Jesus emphasizing this thing? And isn't it just a little bit too harsh? A little bit overcooked? A little bit overdone? And I think the reason Jesus is emphasizing it the way he is and why he's saying that this is how God's going to respond to us is because forgiveness is such a big deal and it should not be fooled around with. Should not be fooled around with. Take note of something that jumped out at me when I was reading this text. The guy that was in debt originally with 10,000 bags of gold of debt, when was he in the worst condition? Before the debt was relieved or after the debt was relieved? After. Because he wasn't forgiving himself. He wasn't forgiving of himself to forgive other people. And as a result, he incurred some deep problems because of his lack of forgiveness that were far greater than his original debt. Folks, every one of you, including myself, has been, give, been forgiven way more than 10,000 bags of gold worth. The question becomes, what are we going to do with that overwhelming forgiveness that we have received? That's the message of this parable. So I asked the question this morning, if it's so obvious we need to forgive, why don't we do that? More freely, more regularly, more often. Why do we struggle with forgiveness like we sometimes do? And I really think the answer to that question is rooted in some big time lack of understanding as it relates to the topic of forgiveness. And so the balance of this morning's lesson we're going to be talking about some things about forgiveness. Some things that forgiveness is and some things that forgiveness is not. And, and, and I'm going to start with the things that forgiveness is not because I don't want to end the lesson with what sounds like a bunch of excuses. Okay? So, what I'm going to say from here on out applies to you and I no matter whether we're dealing with forgiving somebody just because they annoy me or if they bug the snot out of me or if they've done something that's wronged me a little bit or if they've done something that is like really horrifically wronged me or someone that I've loved that I love it covers the whole gamut from small to medium to large to extra large in terms of things we need to forgive so the first thing, I know this is out of order because I goofed up on the PowerPoint, okay? The first thing is forgiveness is not trusting again. It's like the third point down in the second section of your outline if you're filling in the outline. Forgiveness is not trusting again. We get those confused, forgiveness and trust. And forgiveness and trust are two totally different things from God's perspective. God does not say forgive and trust again. He does say forgive. And so the question is begged, do you trust everyone in your life? What's the answer to that? If the answer is yes, we need to have some counseling, okay? Because you're foolish to trust everyone. 
Um, Jesus himself would say, don't cast your pearls before swine. Otherwise, they'll trample them. It, we're wise if we allow people to develop trust and trust grows as we trust people, but forgiveness and trust do not go together. We trust people when they earn trust. So sometimes people come to me and they'll say, Phil, I, I, I know I've really um, uh, done some things where my mom and my dad don't trust me anymore. I said, well, what did you do? And they, they'll tell me, have you owned it? Have you gone to your mom and dad and talked about that? Yeah. Has your mom and dad forgiven you? Yeah. But they don't trust me. I say, you know what? They'll trust you when you earn their trust. Take forgiveness right now. Take forgiveness right now and, 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 and appreciate the fact that they forgive you. Husbands and wives do things that hurt each other's heart. And we have to forgive each other. But trust is something that has to be built and developed over time. Proverbs, the 14th chapter says, the simple believe everything, but the prudent give thought to their steps. And so trust is something that, that develops and, and, and grows. And, and when, when, when we're trustworthy with small things, we can be trusted with medium-sized things. And when we're trustworthy with medium-sized things, we can be trusted with larger things. And that's the way trust accumulates. But forgiveness is a different animal. So don't have this mindset in your mind that just because I forgive somebody, it means that I need to immediately trust that person right now. Give time and space for trust to grow. Second thing that forgiveness is not is forgiveness, oh, by the way, um, well, let me go back. Forgiveness is not forgetting. Forgiveness is not forgetting. You will never see a, a quote in the Bible where Jesus says, God says, a prophet says, somebody inspired by the Holy Spirit says, just forgive and forget. Because we're not capable of that. <laughs> Donna, you do me really wrong. I mean, horrifically wrong. I don't think you would. But if you did me horrifically wrong, you know what? I'm probably going to remember that. I can forgive you, but I'm probably going to remember that. Jesus died on the cross, and while he was on the cross, he uttered these words. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. Brothers and sisters, keep in mind that when he uttered those words, nails were still going through his hands. Thorns were still deeply engraved in, his, in, the, in the crown of his head. Blood was running down his face. His back was still an open wound, and he said, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus had not forgotten what was going on on the cross, but he still forgave. Folks, we have this thing, in our, we make forgiveness really hard on ourselves because we think in order to really truly forgive somebody, I got to forgive, I got to forget. Because we have that little saying in life, well, just forgive and forget. They don't go together. They don't go together. There will be some things that you and I will take to our grave and we will remember because that's the way we're wired. But don't, don't let your lack of ability to forget keep you from forgiving. That's really the message I want to come clear here. Sometimes we have that thing in our, because we can remember, therefore I can't forgive, and that's not godly whatsoever, okay? So forgiveness is not forgetting. And the last thing I wanna say about what forgiveness is not, <coughs> is forgiveness is not removing all the consequences. Forgiveness is not removing all the consequences. When God forgives us, he forgives us completely. Question, do the consequences go away? No. Some of us in this room this morning are living out the consequences of our sin from a year ago, from 20 years ago, from 50 years ago. If I drink every day of my life and I become addicted to alcohol and then one day I turn my life over to God and he, he, he through the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit allow me to break the chains of alcoholism and I'm free of alcohol addiction, 
Do I get a new liver? No, I still have the consequences of the damage that has been done to my body. If you go through life and, 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 and you're, you're, you're unfaithful, you lie to your spouse, can your spouse forgive you? Yeah. Has trust been broken? Yeah. Are there consequences of trust being broken? Absolutely. So we, we have to understand that forgiveness does not mean removing all the consequences. Remember the story in, in the Old Testament where King David um, has that affair with Bathsheba? Sees her on the rooftop, likes what he sees, uh, has an affair with her. They sleep together. They conceive. David goes one step further and he has his, uh, her husband, Uriah, put out on the, the, the military field on the front line so he'll be killed in the line of duty so that he does not get embarrassed by the fact that he impregnated Bathsheba. Basically commits murder. Did David come clean with God? Yeah. He admitted his sin. He went before the prophet Nathan. And in, and in 1 Samuel, the 12th chapter, verses 13 and 14, um, David uh, goes to Nathan and before God, and he says, I've sinned. I, I've done wrong. Finally came to his senses. Were there consequences? Oh, yeah. That baby died as a result of the infidelity. The nation of Israel, while David was king, would never be at peace. They would always be at war. A consequence that had collateral implications to other people, by the way. And so we have to understand that forgiveness, while God forgave completely, David was a man that was free of, 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 of the sin and, 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 and all the he had done and all the evil that he'd committed in his heart and how it had affected other people. God forgave him of all that. But the consequences still were there. So forgiveness is not the absence of consequence. So let's talk now about what forgiveness is. What forgiveness is. And the first thing that forgiveness is, is forgiveness is refusing to seek my own revenge. Refusing to seek my own revenge. If you have a need within your heart this morning to forgive somebody of a small, medium, large, extra large offense, then you need to realize that God's definition of forgiveness is you making a commitment this morning not to invoke revenge upon the person that has wronged you. Not to get back at them, not to even the score, not to find it your delight to put them through the pain that you have gone through. I'll say it this way. Refusing to seek my own revenge means that I'm going to let God be God and let God take care of business. That's just another way of saying the same thing. In every successful um, business or corporation, people that work for that corporation have what's called a duty statement. It defines what their responsibilities are but it also clearly defines what their responsibilities are not. And at Caltrans, I have a duty statement. <coughs> and it tells me what I need to focus on as an employee of Caltrans. And, and everybody that works for me has a duty statement and it clearly defines what their job is. It would be foolish for me to take on the role of the director of Caltrans because it's not on my duty statement to do that. It'd be foolish for me to take that on. And so the best thing I can do is I can do the things that I'm responsible for and not go beyond that. When we go beyond and try to take revenge when it comes to forgiveness, we are doing the duties of someone that is at a much higher pay grade than we are. And that's Jehovah God. God says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. That's his statement. It doesn't belong to Kurt Matthews, and it doesn't belong to Barbara Davis. It belongs to God and God alone. So whenever we try to take on the job of evoking 
vengeance or getting back at people or evening the score, call it whatever you want, the job of dispensing vengeance is left up to God. So who's in charge of the Department of Vengeance? The DOV, not the DMV, but the DOV, the Department of Vengeance? God and God alone. Remember that. So very important. In 1 Peter, the second chapter, verses 21 through 23, scriptures say, <coughs> to this you are called. Because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example. Let's stop right there. I don't care what goes on in your life. I don't know what is going on entirely in your life. All the different hurts, all the different pain, all the different difficulty you can go through. You'll never compare to Jesus. You or I will never compare to what he went through. Jesus set us an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. And when they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted, listen to this last line, instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Boy, there's a good part for our duty statement. That in Phil Baker's duty statement, I need to entrust myself to him who judges justly. In other words, get vengeance off your duty statement, Baker. Okay? And let me admit something else. When I deal with vengeance, sometimes I rationalize vengeance from the standpoint of they had it coming. Or it's just a small little thing. This past week I was driving north on I-5 and I made a lane change. And when I made a lane change, I didn't adequately look over my right shoulder. And I moved into a lane where somebody else was. And I almost took him out. And this person laid on the horn, you know, and I swerved back into my lane. I'm thinking, oh, man. You, you know how you feel when you do that, you know? I got back in my lane, and then up alongside of me comes this little wimpy high school dude, and he's just going, only there was an appendage sticking out, okay, you know? And, and, and I'm, I'm looking at him, and I'm thinking, I'm already embarrassed. You know, I'm already ashamed that I made a bad move on the, on the free, you know. And he just got right in my face, and he's just giving me the what for. A whole bunch of words coming out of his mouth and stuff, you know. And so now I am really lathered up. I'm lathered up, okay. And he gets a little ahead of me, and I'm thinking, okay, it's time to settle the score. Because my conscience is not here, meaning my wife's not in the passenger seat, okay? <laughs> and so I get right in behind him. I get right in behind him, and I start flashing the highlights on him, you know? Even though it's there in the day. I think, that's really going to do a lot of good now, you know? But, but that's why I'm giving him the highlight blinkers, you know? And, 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 and I'm looking at him, and I'm going, I hope he's looking in the rearview mirror, you know? I'm giving this look, you know? Get right up on his bumper, you know? And that's a really smart move, too, in case he hits his brakes, you know? And then I'm rear-ending him, and I could, you know... It was just stupid. But you know, in my mind, when I'm doing all that, I'm thinking, this guy's got it coming. He's got it coming. He's a little wimpy high school dude, you know, and who does he think he is? I take care of these highways. <laughs> but we do that kind of silly stuff. Now, you can take that out of that context and put it into your home life. You can put it into raising kids. You can put it into working with people at your job. Put it wherever you want. You can put it into church where somebody does you wrong here. You know? And we do those silly things. We just got to remember what I should have done is I should have gone, man, that dude, I'm sorry, you know? <laughs> sorry, you know? And let him go on and move on. Okay. Forgiveness is, is refusing to seek my own revenge. Point number two, forgiveness is refusing to be consumed by the past. Refusing to be consumed by the past. We become overwhelmed. We become consumed when we start thinking they got away with it. They're getting away with it. You may even see them do it again to somebody, whatever it is. 
when you start to feel this way, be reminded of the last point. That our God does not let anyone get away with anything. He sees it all. He takes it all in. He knows what to do. He knows how to invoke revengeance. He knows how to distribute rebuke. He knows how to deal with life. And that's just what God does. He will respond to it all. Don't let it consume you. Proverbs 19 verse 11 says this. A man's insight gives him patience. And his virtue, and his virtue is to overlook an offense. I could have used that scripture on I-5 the other day. Just overlook it, Baker. Move on down the road, man. Start thinking about the next important thing in life. Overlook an offense. There comes a very important time in all of our lives when we have to make that conscious decision to move on. Yes, it was big. Yes, it was four months worth of wages. Yes, it was a big hit to me. Yes, when they said it or when they did it, it hurt. But there comes a time in every one of our lives where we have to move on. Because if you don't, then someone else is going to be living rent-free between your ears for the rest of your life. That's the option you got. Someone else is going to have control over your head for the rest of your life. Don't let it happen. My kids, my grandkids, I should say, have forced me. No. They've exposed me. No. They've um, given me the opportunity to listen countless times to a movie called Frozen. <laughs> and the highlight song in the movie Frozen is sung by Queen Elsa. And it's called, Let It Go, Let It Go, Let It Go. I'd dance it out and I'd sing it out, if, but you'd laugh too hard, Kylie, if I did it, okay? <laughs> but it's good advice to us from a godly perspective to have the mindset that we need to let it go. Get to the point in life when you, with God's help and the Holy Spirit's help, can let it go. Let me end this point with one thought. Big people let it go. There's a reason why Jesus didn't put up a fight when he went before the Sanhedrin. When people were whipping his back, when he was hanging on the cross, like the song says, he could have called 10,000 angels, but he let it go. He let it go on because there was salvation going on. Last point, and then the lesson's yours. Forgiveness is just giving to others what God has already given to me. Forgiveness is giving to others what God has already given to me. Oh man, I love the song we just sang. We receive forgiveness like a stream of forgiveness. We receive a river of forgiveness from God. The question of this parable is not how much forgiveness we receive from God. That's defined in the first few verses that 10,000 bags of gold were forgiven debt-wise. The question in this parable is this, how much forgiveness are you going to pass on to the next person? Scripture says, in the same measure that you distribute mercy, mercy will be given to you. We want God to be forgiving of us in mammoth proportions. We want him to flood our lives with forgiveness like you would a fire hose. You know, just gushes of water. The question this morning is, do you distribute forgiveness to other people in the same manner? Do you use the same hose to distribute forgiveness to other people? Do you let God forgive you with a hose and then you turn around and distribute forgiveness to others with an eyedropper? How does your life operate? And this morning we're called to forgive in an abundant fashion. Occasionally in counseling sessions I see that. I see where people come in wanting a good marriage, but they come in to the counseling session with a laundry list 
of things that he or she has done wrong. And they can recite it like it was yesterday. Boom, 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 boom. He's like this, he's like this, he's like this, she's like this, she doesn't do this, she's like this. You know, and they can just name off these things. And whenever I begin a counseling session with a couple, I think, man, we got some ways to go. Because we need to be merciful to each other like God's merciful to us. Don't have a clear list of other people's wrongs, but have a foggy mirror that you look at. We need to look at our own lives with a clear mirror and have a list that goes away on a regular basis and gets burned up. In 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, when the Apostle Paul was giving us a definition of love, he says, love, one of the things he says is love does not keep a record of wrongs. It doesn't mean you forget them, but you don't keep a list so you can turn back over the page. Oh, five years ago? Yep. You know, two years ago? Yep. Kept on doing it. Two years, one year ago? There's no list, either written or in your mind, that you just keep replaying and regurgitating. God wants us to give each other fresh starts because that's what he does with you and me. Gives fresh starts. Yeah, there's big things that happen in our life. I'm not up here this morning to minimize that. I talked to some of you and I, I, I know that God has done some amazing things just to help you get through life knowing the hurt that's come to you. I'm not minimizing that whatsoever. There are 10,000 bag, gold bag type of hurt that occurs. God still says forgive. There's 100 denarii offenses that occur in life. God still says forgive. You know why? Because when we forgive each other, we're doing what God would want us to do. And here's the big kicker. When we forgive that way, we will be blessed. We will be blessed. Let's stand and sing. All hail the power.